Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for coming over. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and an honor, really, to introduce the last speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Joachim Frank, from the Department of Biochemistry, uh, Biological Sciences and Molecular Biophysics of the University of Columbia. As you, you may have seen Dr. Frank on the local news during the last couple of weeks, so we all know a little bit, at least, of his uh, very fruitful academic career. Um, you know that he has contributed very significantly to the development of electron microscopy techniques. Um, so it's, it's a quite a challenge to try to summarize uh, Dr. Frank's CV in, in just a couple of slides, so I'll try to do my best. Uh, so basically, because we are a teaching institution, uh, it, it, it makes sense to me to mention the uh, academic institution that he has been related to from his training in and education in Europe and the United States, say in uh, the Freiburg and Munich universities, the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Germany, Caltech, Berkeley, Cornell University, and, and Cambridge University, more specifically, the Cavendish Lab. Uh, he has held positions at research and academic institutions in the US, uh, mostly uh, Watford Center for Laboratories and Research, the State University of New York, the New York University Medical School, and the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and uh, in the late years, uh, Columbia University. Uh, his work has been published in hundreds of papers in the most prestigious journals, um, and he, he has also written uh, a couple of books, one of them on basically image processing analysis. Um, he has received uh, around 30 honors and distinctions uh, throughout his career. Uh, basically, uh, it's obviously very difficult to mention all of them here, but to, make just, to name just a few, just, he was elected a member to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. Uh, he won the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Sciences, and as we know, he received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2017, uh, shared with Richard Henderson and Jacques Dubochet for the development and the improvement of uh, cryo-electron microscopy for high-resolution structure determination of biomolecules. Uh, he has also received the honoris causa from Sigen Uni University, and he will receive the honoris causa from Universidad Nacional de Cuyo tomorrow evening. Uh, on the side of the scientific contributions, uh, it's, I think he, he has quite a, an amazing trajectory in the sense that he was educated as a physicist. And, and, I mean, he studied physics and mathematics and chemistry, and then he went on to do theory of uh, image formation in transmission electron microscopy during the 70s. Uh, he contributed to the development of mathematical and computational methods for uh, single particle reconstruction from electron microscopy and cryo-electron microscopy images during the 80s and 90s. And uh, it's, it's important to mention that he was involved in the development of this software, SPIDER, which is a, a, it's an image processing software. Uh, he then went on to apply those techniques and methods to um, investigate very important problems in structural biology. During the 90s, he applied all these methods to uh, look at the structure of uh, ribosomes from E. coli and GIST, uh, and GIST uh, with increasing resolution, reaching almost atomic resolution or atomic resolution. And then he applied all these uh, tools to investigate the structural aspects involved in the various stages of uh, protein biosynthesis, and also to look at the structure and dynamics of molecular motors. And obviously we could, you know, I could keep going on mentioning achievements, awards, and publications, and so on. Um, I think that uh, I want to take a slightly different tack here just to, to finish this uh, short um, presentation or introduction of Professor Frank. Um, one is to mention that because he has contributed to uh, developing uh, electron microscopy, I think that that should fire the imagination of many people here in the audience because Mendoza has a tradition on electron microscopy that goes back to the, to the 50s. Uh, so I'm sure that people here will be really looking forward to his lecture. And the second point that I want to, to emphasize is, because we are a teaching institution, just a message to students. If you look at, at Professor Frank's career, 
you know that he was trained as a physicist, a mathematician, and a chemist. So, but then he went on to develop computational tools, and then he went on to apply those tools to investigate very relevant problems in biology, right? So I think this is telling us that it's, it, there's quite a lot of uh, um, possibilities of development when you work at the interfaces between disciplines, when you cross the boundaries. And with this message, uh, I just want to thank you, Professor Frank, for being here. And please, uh, uh, yeah. looking forward to your talk. OK, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Um, uh, since you mentioned it, uh, I still feel like a cheat as a, as a biologist uh, because uh, I, never, I never got uh, rigorous training. Uh, and, uh, but, the, but, but I got my own training in very, very specific areas. And, and somehow I need to knit them together in order to become a biologist. Uh, so I, I'd like to uh, tell you about single particle cryo EM, and and it, it's really I want to I want to I wanna, um, lead you through to, to, to the history of this the, the journey that that got us to the present time, and I have to apologize to the German delegation uh, uh, who has already been exposed to it uh, in uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, but I can only give so many talks. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, animal cell. I, you know, I feel like um, I, the, I can skip many slides because uh, you, you're all very uh, well educated in the, in the whole background. Uh, but, uh, but I, I, I just want to make make a very important point uh, in terms of structural biology. Um, if we look at the animal cell or any cell, uh, we have. Um, Essentially, it's an interactome uh, of many molecules that interact with one another, and uh, mass spectroscopy has, has found out um, that uh, you pick any molecule and you Im immediately pick out uh, 10 or a dozen uh, molecules that interact with them. And uh, so uh, something <coughs> like this has been modeled uh, uh, to, to give you an idea of what, what hap happens in the thermal environment. It's very crowded, uh, all the molecules interact with one another. There are many uh, chances for encounters. Now, that's now a very interesting idea which came up uh, later on. 1998 was very strongly spelled out by Bruce Alberts uh, in, a, uh, <clears throat> in this article in the cell. Um, his point was, was uh, we, have under, uh, we have always underestimated the cell. We, we, you know, when he pointed out when, when he was a graduate student, which was very close to when I was, um, we, we all uh, thought of cells of like a sack of, of molecules interacting with one another. But, but uh, instead, we found out later on with this interactome technique that, um, in fact, uh, there are sort of subgroups of molecules that interact with one another, uh, and very often they, they interact with one another uh, as, a, as a molecular machine, as a processed molecular machine, which means that there's really a beginning and an end. And they're uh, in between products, and there are ligands coming and going, and all, everything is perfectly choreographed. So we, we wish not only to know the structure, uh, of the all components, but also the way they interact dynamically. And uh, reductionism, we all uh, know and love the term because we are using it. Uh, we study this system in vitro uh, in, in isolation and then hope that what we find can somehow be applied to the context of the cell. Uh, it's only an approximation, but very often we get very solid knowledge from this. <clears throat> OK, so then uh, th these are just examples, and you immediately spot uh, uh, what they're doing. Um, and, um, but, the, but now the point is that uh, in, in such a molecular machine, we have multiple states. We have <coughs> uh, transitional states. Um, and and uh, in order to really fully understand the system, uh, we need to see uh, everything 
essentially in motion. We see, have to see all the intermediate products. And uh, you can immediately see that uh, the, the, the main technique that has given us structural information cannot supply this kind of information, extra crystallography, because it only depicts uh, molecules uh, in, a, in, a, in a very few states, the, the ones that are allowed by the crystal formation, and not the others. So many functional states escape, and then ob obviously there are many, uh, <clears throat> many of these supramolecular complexes that are very flexible and so forth, and they cannot be crystallized. Okay. <clears throat> So extra crystallography, many copies of the molecule are arranged in a molecular order. Exposure to the X-ray beam gives us a diffraction pattern. And then with clever methods of phasing, we get a structure. First structure, 1962, uh, <coughs> first very, very well-known structure um, was hemoglobin. Max Perutz and John Kendrew uh, are shown here with a model of it. The X-ray beam must be high intensity because the molecule is so large. Uh, so each uh, molecule scatters only uh, <coughs> weakly. Uh, and the crystal must be almost perfect. Today, uh, 140 structure, 140,000 structures have been solved by X-ray crystallography. They're all in the public database. They form the basics uh, of, of molecular medicine. Medicine before, before all this onslaught of, of structures uh, was, was, was not a very precise uh, a <clears throat> practice uh, because it, 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 it had to be informed uh, by many other th things, but, uh, but not by the knowledge of, of the actual interactions in the cell. Uh, now, what's wrong with actual crystallography? Um, because of the crystal packing, molecules are not visualized in all conformation and binding states that are important for function. Many molecules do not form highly ordered crystals, or they don't form crystals at all. Uh, sample quantity can be a big issue. Sometimes we have, you have so small uh, quantities that you cannot make all the different crystallization trials uh, in the matrix uh, way that are necessary for X-ray crystallography. So, uh, fortunately, there is the other technique, electron microscopy, um, and it, can, it has been used for decades to look at all kinds of things, tissue sections and so forth, but, but not at molecules. Only the, 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 the interest in molecules came, came up in the 60s. <clears throat> so we have um, the, the practical uh, magnifications are in the range of 30,000. Uh, to reconstruction object, many different views must be collected and somehow combined. Um, the sample must be very thin, that's very important. Electrons are readily absorbed by matter, and there is a certain range that we can use uh, where, uh, more, um, where an, a lot of elastic scattering is, is collected, which is, is, is the kind of scattering that carries information. Inelastic scattering is bad, it damages the the specimen and it doesn't contribute to the image. <clears throat> and for the same reason, uh, there has to be vacuum in the column because otherwise electrons would, would get stuck after a few millimeters. <clears throat> so the problem is electrons strongly damage the molecules. There is a need for low dose. But if you go down with the dose, uh, you don't see the molecule. It looks like salt and pepper, which simply means there is no use looking at a single molecule. You always have to do uh, averages. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So um, now this averaging that immediately brings in the um, the idea of of looking at crystals because in crystals you have regular arrangements of of molecules and so you automatically have some kind of an averaging process. Uh, in, the, in play, uh, you know, uh, if you know the symmetry, then, then given a, a, a view of a molecule, you can predict all the other views. Okay, so uh, somehow uh, <clears throat> uh, crystals uh, and ordered arrangements make make life easy. Um, 
And so, but the first 3D reconstruction ever, uh, not just in electron microscopy, but in any field, was done by Aaron Klug and David de Rossier, using principles that had been formulated by Johannes Radon in 1917. And unfortunate for him, there were no computers around, so people had to wait until this uh, all happened. <clears throat> okay, so Aaron Klug and David de Rossier looked at the bacteriophage tail, uh, which is, is a highly um, a symmetric um, a structure, it has helical symmetry, um, <clears throat> and uh, in fact, for a helical structure, a single view is even sufficient because all the other views are somehow imp implied. No, but back to Radon's theorem. Uh, Radon is, is saying <clears throat> that um, when you um, want to reconstruct an object, what you have to do is take projections in different directions. And these projections form, in Fourier space, they form central sections uh, of the three-dimensional Fourier transform. And what one had to do is, is get as many sections as possible, and then by some kind of interpolation process, uh, recover the entire three-dimensional Fourier transform. And then uh, one simply goes back into real space with an inverse Fourier transform. So that's simply the, the concept of, of 3D reconstruction. Uh, it might be in, in, in practice, it might be, uh, <coughs> it might be done differently, uh, not through this elaborate process, but it's always in, uh, exactly equivalent. If you do it in real space, you, you, you would do exactly the same operation. So anyway, so this was the groundbreaking the <coughs> discovery or invention. Um, and, uh, but sort of the take home message is uh, <coughs> the math and computational procedures were tailored to the geometry of this object. So, so they could not be applied to anything else. Uh, so you have one mathematical apparatus and it could only do helical structures. And the same was then uh, with Tony Crowther. Tony Crowther developed uh, a system of, of reconstructing spherical viruses. You had icosahedral symmetry. Uh, so now he developed another mathematical apparatus that dealt with that symmetry. It could not deal with others. Okay. Uh, here's the third kind, Richard Henders and Nigel Unwin. They were the first to, to get a relatively high resolution structure from a, <clears throat> from a two-dimensional crystal uh, of Bacteriorhodopsin. And uh, they, they reconstructed a seven helix bundle at seven angstrom re resolution. The resolution and, and the coverage of, of data in Fourier space was not sufficient to find, find the continuity of the helixes, how they are connected. So they went up with 70,000 uh, possibilities. And by some clever arguments, they, they whittled it down to a few. Uh, <clears throat> but later on, higher resolution came about, and then this entire structure came. But, but, <clears throat> but they had one, one uh, breakthrough uh, was involved here, which is the, uh, first of all, they, they used low dose. And then they used glucose embedding uh, instead of negative stain. Negative staining was the only technique available at the time. And, and they sort of uh, <coughs> invented glucose embedding, which at least comes closer to the, the liquid environment of the molecule. But it's a very tedious technique in, in, in terms of the contrast, because glucose closely matches the contrast of the protein. So it's a very difficult technique to use. <coughs> anyway, so this was the third example of uh, <coughs> mathematical apparatus tailored to the, uh, the geometry uh, of, of, a, of a crystalline arrangement. So my mentor, mentor Hopper, Walter Hopper, who was an X-ray crystallographer, by the way, and he developed an interest in, X in, in electron microscopy. Uh, so, so he thought, uh, why not you know, take the, put the molecules on, on a grid and tilt this grid in, in, many different, uh, <clears throat> in many different tilts. And then 
we, we can then essentially reconstruct the entire grid with everything on it, um, and among them are the molecules that we're interested in. And the problem with this was that <laughs> the electron exposure uh, exceeded 1,000 electrons per angstrom square. Uh, with with an, uh, such an exposure, the molecule essentially <coughs> burns to, to cinder. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it, it will not be recognizable as the molecule that, it, that, that you actually want to get information on. Um, so, so I developed my ideas in essentially contradi contradistinction to, to this, this idea. Uh, I also wanted to have a general idea, uh, a general uh, technique that, didn't, uh, that was not tied to symmetries. Um, and so this, this was the idea of 3D reconstruction of asymmetric molecules by single particle technique. The concept was um, single particle technique, structural information comes from images of single, which means unattached molecules that exist in many copies. But if you do a cell extract, you don't get a single molecule, you don't get thousands, you get millions, and they all have essentially the identical structure. So why not take advantage of this? All are, are in, in different random orientation. So they tilt themselves. I don't, we don't have to tilt them. And, and it, since there are so many of them, that um, <clears throat> makes it possible to go down with a dose because we can average out over many copies in the end. <clears throat> and they, an important point uh, later was that um, molecules are free to assume our naturally occurring conformation. So even though they have identical structure, they still uh, are able to uh, perform the, the normal conformational changes that they are normally do in this thermal environment. <clears throat> but at the beginning, that was not, that was not the, uh, the forte, you know, because I had to come up with an idea of, of making something work for molecules that are actually, uh, absolutely identical, okay? <clears throat> So, but molecules are random oriented. A single snapshot may already give us hundreds of particle views. And if that's not sufficient, I just add more and more and more. It's just a problem of data collection in order to fill out the entire angular uh, round. So, in my thesis, um, I found out that um, I, could, I could use the translational cross correlation function uh, to align. Uh, Micrographs uh, with very high precision. Uh, the precision was uh, in the range of the uh, resolution of the of the instrument, and that gave me the idea that you know maybe I can do this with parts of the micro uh, micrograph, namely with molecules themselves. <clears throat> so um, I published a short note, note in 1975. The significance of this here is this is the volume one of ultramicroscopy, uh, and a new journal that is desperate to get articles, okay? So I have to <laughs> minimize the importance of this. But, but I managed to get this in here, uh, averaging of low exposure electron microscopes of non-periodic objects. I make specific reference to Unwin and Henderson because of their landmark work uh, on the <coughs> bacteria dobson. And the, the, the tenor of the article was simply uh, you know, if they can do it with uh, bacteria adoption, with, with cross-line arrangement, can't we do it with single molecules? And then uh, we just have to, have to see um, <clears throat> whether, uh, whether the alignment uh, is going to work and so forth. So it was essentially an, a, a concept paper. <clears throat> but then uh, somebody got wind of this in, in science, and he said, if such methods that means for averaging data from arrays for uh, are not periodic were to be perfected then, in the words of one scientist, the sky would be the limit. And I fortunately, I found this quote after a long time uh, because I thought it's so important <laughs> to be reminded of this because now we feel we are right there now, okay? <clears throat> um, and and yeah, yeah, I mentioned the, I mentioned the conditions um, uh, you know, is it, is it ever going to work? And uh, so together with Owen Sexton at, Cav at the Cavendish lab, 
uh, we developed this, uh, which we called uh, detection equation, uh, which gives us a formula for the feasibility of alignment uh, of, of, of molecules of a certain size at a certain shot noise uh, condition uh, and at, at a certain resolution. And, and I, I don't want to go into the detail, but what it tells us, what it told us at the time was that for a molecule of the size of the ribosome, um, <clears throat> even if it were embedded in ice, we would get to essentially atomic resolution. And so that was sort of the motivating equation at the time uh, when we essentially we had nothing. We had only concepts. <clears throat> um, so, but then the devil is in the details. We, and the most problem, the, 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 the biggest problem is, of, of course, we have deferred uh, the determination of the angles. You know, uh, we didn't tilt. Uh, we let the molecules themselves do their own tilting, but we don't know the tilts. Okay, so now we have to get the tilts after the effect. Uh, so everything is now in the detail of the computation. <clears throat> uh, and that was about the time when I, <clears throat> when I uh, <clears throat> started developing uh, the SPIDER system. It's a mod modular image processing system. The idea was, was uh, that when, when you have such a fantastically large research program, uh, you don't know the beginning and the end, you, you don't know what you need to develop uh, and what idea you have the next day. Um, and so you cannot simply have a, a big program like a graduate student program uh, that each time you get an idea you make it a little bigger. Uh, so, uh, so the idea here was to develop a modular system which means that any operation that you have already solved, um, you, you already know how to do it, you would delegate to uh, some kind of a routine that can be called uh, by, by, by some kind of a script language, okay? So here, these are examples, autocorrelation, cross-correlation, Fourier transform, rotate, shift, window, and so forth. So it, each is just an, an, an operation that can be invoked by a command. So now we can put all these different things together in any order we want um, and, uh, and design a very, in, in a very open-ended way, uh, designing a workflow. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, and this had, 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 the, had the advantage uh, that, that any colleagues uh, who didn't have a deep mathematical background could, could also construct these programs. They, could, they knew the concept and that was, and it was enough. Okay, so that was the very important thing. The alignment and, and averaging using this cross-correlation idea and rotational correlation, we had essentially proof of concept. Uh, and here is where the ribosome came in in a very fortuitous way. Uh, somebody approached me uh, the, he had heard about the idea of single particle, and, and he was from uh, Miloslav, Miloslav Wublik uh, from Rush, and, and he approached me, he had these beautiful images of uh, HeLa uh, <coughs> ribosomes. Uh, these are small subunits of HeLa ribosomes. He approached me, would, would, this, would this be a poss possible, uh, you know, most molecule that you could try? It was fantastic for this purpose. It's, it's very well-defined, it was essentially an unknown structure at the time, and um, we could show that we get very uh, crisp, um, <clears throat> reproducible averages. This was sort of a takeoff of, um, uh, of the technique. And then there's a problem of heterogeneity. What, what can you do if you have molecules that have different orientations uh, and, and are in different conformations? So we had to had a, a two-dimensional uh, system for classifying molecules uh, in order to de deal with this heterogeneity. And there, uh, <clears throat> there was a very, um, <clears throat> very important coincidence. Um, I was at a, at a lab uh, where <clears throat> laboratory scientists used multivariate statistical analysis in order to sort blood samples from patients. And it was very fortuitous. I saw these 
uh, these kinds of methods, and then I saw immediately they could be used to, uh, to sort images, aligned images. So, so patients were images, essentially, and the blood samples uh, were, uh, were the pixels. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so now the, the very important problem of, of uh, identifying uh, the, the orientations, uh, this is just a sketch on, a, on an overhead, and I have a, a later American scientist made, made a very fancy representation for this. The whole idea is that the, <clears throat> uh, when you have, when you concentrate on a, on a subset of molecules that face the, the grid in the same orientation, uh, and they all ha are in different azimuthal orientations, you don't get anything, any new information. They just lie in different orientation. But the situation changes if you give this specimen a very big tilt, like 50 or 60 degrees, then all of a sudden these have a unique uh, three-dimensional views of the object. And in, <clears throat> from the point of view of the molecules, it looks as if the electron microscope had walked around in, in a cone. Okay? So we call it random conical because these here are not e equidistant, but random. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> that kind of data collection gives you everything. It gives you the, uh, the, <clears throat> the azimuths of these angles, and you know exactly the tilt angle because that's what you applied here. Uh, so it gives you at once the entire geometry of all the, <clears throat> of all the molecules. And so this kind of reconstruction we've done for the first time. Uh, this was done with the help of Michael Radermacher, a very gifted um, postdoc at the time, who also were trained, trained with, with Hopper. Uh, and at the time, <clears throat> yeah, here, I have him right here, oops, okay, <clears throat> right here. Uh, we are somewhere near, near Albany. <clears throat> so at the time, uh, we used three-dimensional stacks of, of contours in order to uh, show a, a, a reconstruction. And this is such a contour stack that I uh, rescued from the time, you know, decades ago, and I still had it when the Nobel Museum asked uh, me, as, as it asked other people, uh, other Nobel Prize winners, to, to bring something that was related to the discovery of, or invention. And I thought this was the perfect thing to bring them. <clears throat> and here, uh, we are here in the Nobel Museum. We show these things. Uh, here is this uh, with a light box. <clears throat> Uh, Jacques Dubochet with the first primitive plunging device, and uh, Richard Henderson shows off his uh, first atomic model of the bacteria dopsin. <clears throat> so, but it was, was sort of a jump forward in time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jack uh, got, uh, got his prize because uh, of the invention, this very important invention of the uh, <coughs> embedding in vitreous eyes. Before, as I told you, we had only had negative stain. What I showed you before was a reconstruction all with negative stain. Up to this point, we had not implemented the uh, vitreous eyes embedding. And uh, so from, from uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, he did this uh, very important paper in 1981, but then it took, it took a while until sort of it spread uh, out in the, in the community, and uh, uh, in 19, uh, 1988 uh, was was the first the, the first reconstruction that we did uh, with this. So now um, we all use uh, uh, <coughs> the vitreous ice technique, um, and uh, this was an, uh, a, at the time it was a very modern uh, electron microscope, it was the Polara. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, to get it in Albany, the first on the American <coughs> continent. Um, and then now it's, uh, of course, superseded by these uh, huge 14 feet, uh, 14 feet uh, things that are big boxes, uh, the Creos Titan. And 
uh, but, but this one here is still functioning uh, in, in New York. Uh, so we have plunge freezers. Uh, this, is, this is a hand-built one for $200. These are $60,000 uh, round. Uh, and the difference is, um, it, the difference is not marginal, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, many people still use this here. Uh, the difference is that uh, you're not dependent on temperature and climate and so forth. You, uh, you, you get irreproducible uh, a, a grids from one day to the other. And <clears throat> um, so here, here are ribosomes recorded on film. You see the, the contrast is not, not that great. Um, I also to have to tell you that um, <clears throat> Uh, before I showed you this uh, random conical tilt reconstruction, this was a, what we call a bootstrap reconstruction. If you don't know anything about a structure, then you would start in this way. But once you have um, in the, the, uh, the kind of knowledge of a bootstrap reconstruction, then you co can go on and do refinements, uh, uh, angular refinements in this way. Um, so, but um, from our point of view, or my point of view of single particle uh, reconstruction technique, uh, we were very happy uh, we could take any molecule now, uh, and I have uh, a, a number of collab uh, <coughs> collaborations uh, with hemocyanin, calcium release channel. This was the first uh, three-year uh, structure of the calcium release channel at the time. Uh, but then, of course, um, we were thrilled to get uh, such um, new information about the ribosome that had never, never been seen uh, in this way before. Uh, it brought us to this paper in 1995, which, um, which really was sort of a milestone paper because we, we could place all the components, uh, mRNA, tRNA, and, and these placements uh, are, are still valid. You know, we simply inferred them from the channels and uh, location of tunnels that we had there. <clears throat> um, and and I, I just, you know, for people who, um, who want to know a little bit about the ribosome, here it is uh, at that kind of resolution uh, with the tRNAs attached. Um, and then for the first time, we were able to um, essentially put together the elongation cycle because we had uh, gotten reconstruction uh, with, with EFG and uh, the ternary complex with EFTU all in place. We could uh, put this together and this has been reproduced in textbooks everywhere. Uh, and then uh, a very big event for us, occurred when we discovered the ratchet-like motion during translocation. It was the first time we saw very large conformational change uh, using, uh, <clears throat> using the uh, uh, cryo-electron microscopy. At that time, uh, <clears throat> that was, we discovered it in 2000. This, this happens to be in um, a, a movie from 2003, but 2000, 2000 was co coincident with the uh, X-ray structures that came out for the first time. <clears throat> um, so now, now one important uh, technique uh, that came along was maximum likelihood methods of classification. Uh, we found out that by using these very powerful technique, we were able to extract several reconstructions at the same time from a sample. So you could have molecules in different conformations or, or uh, binding states, and this, and, and, and this algorithm looking at this sea of, of, of very different um, projections was able to extract them all at the same time. So now we don't have to do separate experiments. We get the, we get everything at the same time. Yeah, I was very excited about this and called it story and a sample. Because then <clears throat> you can think of, of extracting them all, putting them on a on a on a on a board and making arrows in between and using other knowledge uh, in order to uh, produce a storyline. 
So now this is a completely uh, routine way of doing it. <clears throat> Initially, when I first developed this technique, uh, I thought we had to be highly pure. We have to uh, do the utmost to get close to 100%. And now we have the opposite view. We, we want to have it dirty, okay? Uh, because we want, we want to have the, the initial uh, <clears throat> uh, inventory of, of, of molecules and want to see how they're related to each other. And that is, is the important uh, point in, in looking at molecular machines. Because if you have in vitro systems that run by themselves, uh, as you have for the, for the ribosome, then you have at any given moment, you can make a snapshot and you see all the intermediate products are there. And you can extract them and then put arrows in between. Um, so there, there were sort of, uh, I'm showing the slide to say, there were many inventions along the way and we were not the only ones who participated because meanwhile, many other groups uh, sort of jumped on the bandwagon and, and or did methods development. Um, so then uh, there is a sort of an, an, an important, important um, mark, marking point is in 2012, actually. Uh, uh, but, <clears throat> but it always takes some time in order to get realized. Uh, so um, this is our last uh, reconstruction that we did by, with recording on film. Uh, a, anybody who has worked with film and electron microscope, you know, it's such a messy thing. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds that need to be processed in exactly the same way. And then, uh, and then you have the, you have the uh, images and, and now you have to scan them in and, and it's, it's an endless process. So, so this took this person two years uh, to get to this point. So we get the best resolution from recording on film 5.5 uh, angstroms. We got stuck there. This is the best resolution that was ever obtained uh, with film for a completely asymmetric object. Okay? And 2012 was exactly the time when these uh, new detectors, the uh, <clears throat> single electron detection uh, devices came out from three different companies. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, everything uh, became a revolution, a revolution of resolution. Uh, this entire technique, the single particle technique, all of a sudden became very big. Uh, nobody had heard about it before, and now everybody heard about it, uh, because for the first time, we got to atomic resolution. And now we have a technique that is really on par with actual crystallography. And the only difference is that it doesn't need crystals and it, it gives you, it gives you um, molecules in, in different functional states, uh, really functionally important states. <clears throat> Here is the difference that these detectors made in terms of the uh, <clears throat> in terms of this, uh, modulation transfer function or uh, Big is, is, is good okay, uh, for people who don't know, know this. Here we are at the Nyquist uh, frequency, and uh, we are very low down here with the film, and uh, we more, more than doubled this uh, performance. And uh, this is also very important to get to, get to very high, uh, <coughs> low resolution performance. Uh, so these uh, have, have completely changed the, the whole business. Uh, even, even looking, at a, at a raw micrograph, you can, can already tell you the difference. <coughs> um, so we took advantage of this. Uh, here is an, uh, um, uh, an example where we used uh, uh, <coughs> a, a specimen um, with an allocation factor G mutant bound to the ribosome, and that has the effect that the uh, GD hydrolysis cannot cannot take place. The, the, the EFG simply get, gets stuck there, and uh, you can you can see here uh, there's an amazing variety of structures that come out where we, we see the uh, EF, EFG 
in different conformations. And we also see tRNAs uh, at particular places uh, without uh, EFG bound. So we get this in the entire assortment of structures that we can then interpret. <clears throat> uh, and then, so this was my favorite. Uh, one of my postdocs got a 2.5 angstrom structure of the T. Cruci ribosome, uh, <clears throat> which is, by the way, very much related to the work by Mariano Levine uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, the whole work uh, on T. Cruci uh, started uh, by an agreement on collaboration between, between him and me uh, when, when I met him a long time ago in, uh, <clears throat> at, uh, at the Howard Youth Institute. So, um, so here uh, we, we get an amazing uh, <clears throat> assortment of, of structures. You, you, can, you can see uh, base pairing right here. We see individual magnesium uh, ions. Uh, we even see water molecules right here. We have water molecule in, in the correct uh, coordinating distance. So that I ever would see a water molecule in my life uh, reconstructed by cryo-EM, I would never have uh, <coughs> thought possible. Uh, <coughs> and here is a, it's just another uh, way of uh, de describing this reconstruction, which, which is really beautiful, this, this T. cruci uh, that has uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, tRNAs attached. Uh, you, you, see <clears throat> you see blue here. Uh, blue uh, denotes the highest resolution. It goes all the way to 2.3 angstrom resolution uh, here in the, in the center of it. And outside resolution is, is less. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's lower because of the flexibility. Okay, and then of course there came the time when uh, a lot of people got very interested in uh, what I could do with the with the electron microscope. So I got uh, involved in collaborations. This is my first um, ion channel that I did in a collaboration with someone uh, upstairs and also at, at close to atomic resolution. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I, showed you, I showed you this reconstruction before, um, uh, back uh, <coughs> when uh, it was a collaboration with Sidney Fleischer. Uh, and, and more recently now, um, I got involved in a collaboration with um, Wayne Hendrickson and uh, Andy Marks. Uh, who had together tried uh, X-ray crystallography for nine years and were stuck at seven angstroms. And within a few months, we were at four angstroms, and now we are uh, close to three angstroms. So in conclusion, a uh, single particle cry -EM, a new era in uh, structural biology, no need for crystals, very small sample quantity is needed. Resolution in the range three to four angstrom is now routinely available. Multiple structures can be retrieved from the same sample, so we get more, more clues on functions. Molecules are in close to native conditions. And solving structures of membrane proteins particularly is, is much easier than with X-ray crystallography. There's huge expansion of it's taking place right now, and it, within a few years, we will see this really exponentially go up uh, in the, <coughs> in the uh, database. Uh, the impact in biology and molecular medicine uh, transmembrane proteins with particular biomedical significance, ion channels, re receptors. Uh, here's an example of the CFTR uh, and a pain receptor. Uh, and, then, and then the other, uh, this should be a two here, it's not identical. Um, <coughs> a large molecular assemblies, uh, supramolecular assemblies uh, that are sort of changing quickly in, in, the, in the whole process uh, of, of making, their, uh, <coughs> making their reaction uh, are uh, 
are very important because they could not be tackled uh, with X-ray crystallography. Uh, a wonderful example is a spliceosome, uh, it, which, uh, which was um, done by Yi Gong Shi, uh, and uh, it was published in Cell. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we are also uh, working on the human uh, CFTR. Um, and, uh, but this, is, this one is the one that was done at the uh, Rockefeller Institute. But um, uh, this was, this came out in 2017, uh, and that was come, came out before uh, I got the Nobel Prize. And then so I was very touched by an email that I got uh, from someone um, who is um, actually at Columbia University. I want to add to the chorus of congratulations that you have no doubt received since the Nobel was announced. I have a special reason to send you a thank you as well. My seven-year-old grandson, Jackson, was diagnosed with CF as a newborn in 2010. I have attached news that we received this week regarding his 10 months on combination therapy. So I just wanted to share this as a small expression of my and Jackson's gratitude. I was stunned first. What would I have to do with this CDCFTR? But then I, I thought, yeah, he is really, he's really acknowledging that, that my contributions led uh, these people to construct it. So I was very touched by this. <clears throat> um, and then I received another <laughs> email message uh, which referred to a, a simple trick. Um, I am a huge fan of your wor work, sir. We all played statue game in our, in our childhood, but who knew that you and your group would apply this simple trick to unravel macromolecular level mysteries? Okay. So I never thought about it in this context, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's a very nice way of of, of putting it. <clears throat> um, so at, at this uh, stage, I uh, like to. Uh, give thanks to the many students, and uh, there's not sp no space here on the slide for all the different people who have contributed. But this, these are these are actually not students, but collaborators. These are collaborators, and they just fit on the slide. Um, and uh, Mariano Levine is is uh, is one of them. And then I uh, always like to thank my wife, who really uh, kept uh, <coughs> kept me kept me sane uh, during all this time. Uh, and uh, OK, uh, so here we are uh, on top of the black building of Columbia University. Thank you. <laughs>